Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our eminent panelists onto the stage for panel discussion five. Let's put our hands together to welcome them. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished moderator for this session, Mr. Sundar Natrajan, is the Chief Risk Officer at India First Life Insurance. He is a certified fellow of the Institute of Risk Management, IRM's Level 5. He is also on the governance board of IRM India Affiliate. Back in mid-90s, he was influenced by a mentor who suggested enterprise risk management as the profession of the next century and guided him to be IRM's global certification and qualification. In a career spanning 25 years, he has worked in the insurance industry for two decades, has proven excellence across diverse functions including sales, customer service, strategy, Bank Assurance, Customer Retention, and also Operations, Quality, Business Planning, Training, Communication, and Governance. And with those words of introduction, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to hand over to our chairperson to kindly carry forward the proceedings of this session. I would uh, remind you, sir, that you have about 1 hour 15 minutes for the session. Over to you, sir. Am I audible now? Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, nice introduction. Uh, uh, it's a proud privilege uh, to be sitting amongst uh, uh, such uh, legendary uh, academicians and uh, people from the industry. Um, so, uh, you know, the endeavor today is to find a confluence of uh, how risk management, uh, you know, is relevant to higher education, uh, how uh, can we cultivate resilience uh, as a concept uh, in uh, higher education, uh, both uh, within the educational institution as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, to teach uh, risk management at uh, higher education institutions so that it can get consumed by the industry. So let me start off by uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, how I got, uh, you know, inducted into risk management, you know, uh, you know, she nicely mentioned and I had a mentor, yes, I did have, a uh, quarter of a century back, uh, seems uh, like the Jurassic era now. Uh, and uh, at that time when I was doing a project for risk management, you know, as a part of my IRM certification, uh, risk management was uh, balance sheet gap analysis. Risk management was safety. If it was manufacturing, it was safety. If it was financial services, it was balance sheet maturity gap. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a little bit here and there. It was nowhere what it is today. You know, if I were to put down something similar today to my risk management committee, I would be pulled up badly. Okay, so today, uh, to give you a broad idea uh, in the in the banking and financial services and insurance sector, which is where you see some amount of evolution in risk management. And that is thanks to a very good regulation, uh, supported by regulation. Uh, you know, we have a fair degree of corporate governance, good governance uh, in place today. Uh, we have, uh, for example, we have uh, my company, which I represent, uh, has uh, risk management right at the top. There is a tone at the top set by not only the managing director, but by the board. The board approves of a risk appetite framework, okay, a risk appetite statement. There is a risk appetite framework uh, where, where tolerance limits are set. And these are not only for uh, uh, make or break items uh, uh, of the organization. These are not only about uh, retaining shareholder value. They are about uh, going beyond shareholder value. They are, go they are about addressing all stakeholders, stakeholders like customers, stakeholders like uh, distributors, distribution partners, the entire supply chain, uh, uh, stakeholders like the regulator, which is uh, good governance. Um, and uh, that, you know, to, to do that, uh, the board, up, in addition to such a framework, as a, as a part of this risk framework, uh, we have uh, very uh, good enabling uh, policies. Uh, you know, these are approved by the board. 
you know, uh, they, the, these policies uh, give guidance on how to run the organization. And uh, risk management policy is one of them. You know, it could be a manufacturing policy, it could be a distribution policy, it could be a human capital policy. And these policies are in turn translated into uh, standard operating processes, uh, which uh, give the guiding, which are the guiding beacon for the functions in the organization to practice that particular function. And what we have done is, uh, and most many organizations uh, have done this, is uh, we have risk experts or risk champions in each function. Uh, and these uh, are the uh, people who uh, keep a watch uh, and they do a risk control and self-assessment. So you, you do a risk control and self-assessment, you check out if the standard operating process is working right or wrong, and if it is not, then you do, uh, you identify, flag that off as a problem, and uh, then you do a root cause analysis, you do some corrective and preventive action. So that you address, you kill the issue right then and there, and don't wait for, let's say, about a year, year and a half for an external agency or an internal audit function to come, come and pick holes, right? So now all of this is supported by an internal audit function, uh, which we call as a third line of defense. You know, your, your uh, practitioner, your function is the first line, the risk management function is the second line, and the internal audit is a third line of defense. That third line of defense gives independent assurance to the board, uh, saying that everything's all right. Okay, your SOPs are being done, they are adequate, they are in line with regulation, so on and so forth. So this is a very broad risk management framework which today is in practice uh, across the BFSI sector in India. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, some of the uh, listed companies or companies where uh, you have a risk culture in place, thanks to their promoter, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, risk-based uh, decisions being taken. Now, how, how is this uh, relevant? You know, this is relevant because this is the end state. This is where consumption of risk education gets culminated. Uh, and uh, that's what, what we are going to talk about since, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a practitioner and uh, I'm in the midst of uh, esteemed academicians. Uh, I will uh, turn to them uh, to seek uh, how they practice risk management and how uh, they uh, can preach risk management so that, you know, it is relevant to this audience, uh, which is all uh, uh, academicians, and, uh, you know, how you can take this uh, back into your uh, institutions and uh, uh, how you can uh, practice risk management and how you can uh, uh, teach risk management and which is relevant for uh, the, uh, uh, you know, thinkers and leaders of tomorrow. Uh, on that note, uh, can I request uh, 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 Dr. Sanyal, if you can um, uh, make an opening statement. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would have bad throat, so please excuse me from that point of view. Well, uh, I'm extremely happy that this uh, topic has been taken into consideration by Fiki. And I can see a lot of academicians in this panel, too. Risk management till yesterday was thought that is, a, is to be practiced by the industry, not by education institute much. But things have changed, and I can tell you, and uh, uh, there are two aspects, actually. But one aspect is that uh, uh, from the higher education point of view, some it is all about higher education, how the educational institute should react to it. So one part is that, as I said, two part, is that how you prepare your students who can contribute in helping the industry where they join in their risk management effort. The other part is that how your organization, the institute itself, gets ready for risk-taking ability. I'll speak more on whether it is important for the higher education institutes to uh, have their own policy, a structure in place. I'll talk about that today. I can tell you for sure, and COVID is so not actually, how critical it is to have a risk management structure, a policy, and a framework 
to fall upon when there is a risk in the system. We also, so many institutes in the country, so many institutes, I can tell you. I'm from a business schools framework, but still I can tell you, a lot of institutes in the country had to close down or struggle a lot to, to be back to their, now what they are doing now, until still they are not able to come out because they didn't have a proper policy to fall back. Now, I am from Great Lake Institute of Management, Gurgaon. Whether we had, yes, we had. We are a young institute, we are deliberating or not. Whether there is a regulatory framework available for that, whether AICT or NBA force you all to do it, till date, not enforceable, but it's coming up. Where the international accreditation agency, I can see some of them are sitting over here, where they do enforce, yes. ASCB, quiz, they now need a risk management framework, whether you have it or not, and how it goes about. And they understood after, and this all awakening is coming after the COVID most probably. But luckily we had a framework, we did redefine it after the COVID, but we did have a framework. I will speak about a few of what we did at Great Lex. We, uh, we found out what are the risk areas first. And uh, I will just request the, the people who are, and most of the people are from higher education over here, that is so critical, let me emphasize, to have your own framework and to find out what are your risk areas. First step is what are your risk of, where, what risk are there? Like for us, we found out nine areas where we need to concentrate. The first area we found out brand equity or brand visibility. And brand visibility, and then we found out likelihood of risk occurring of this brand, impact of it if it happens, and severity of it, depending on the likelihood and impact. So say for brand visibility, uh, Great Lake found out that likelihood of risk occurring is low. But if it happens, the impact will be very high. So severity based on likelihood and impact, we found out very high. That we found out is what it is. So how to do it, how to mitigate it? We should have a mitigation strategy. We developed a framework where we say the school is working on a 360 degree. We have to work on 360 degree basis and we have people to look after them to, uh, and involving, and this CCD works on involving the, uh, regulate, uh, regular communication with important stakeholders through marketing activities, alum outreach, industry engagement, conducting conference, obtaining, reaching funding, collaborating with, with external faculty for research, students participation in external competition. So he did a whole lot of activity, we should keep on doing it so that our brand visibility is not jeopardized. It is done end. And you can see little bit of social media, uh, just sneezing can cause problem in your, uh, in your brand. So we had this, so one, what are the risks? Impact of the risk, likelihood of the risk, severity of the risk. If the risk happen, what is your mitigation strategy? How to mitigate so that it doesn't happen? And we have to have someone or a group of people responsible for every risk. So for this brand visibility, we had uh, the director, the chief marketing officer, the corporate and career, that is our uh, placement department, program directors of the program, various program, then research uh, and ranking and accreditation committee, alumni head. So all these people are, are involved and we have regular meetings to see whether we are doing okay or not. The other nine, I can tell you, I'll, uh, we had admission, and admission whether there is a drop in intake, lack of diversity in incoming batch. We may not have drop, we may not have drop in intake, but we may be skewed towards admitting a particular uh, set of students, engineering or, or BBA or it can happen. So we have to see that and drop in quality of education. So while we are talking about admission, there are two aspects we talk. 
intake and quality. And how it is again? Uh, our, we found low impact on likelihood of risk occurring low, but if it happens, it's higher. Similar severity is medium because we have. So, and we had risk strategy, mitigation strategy for that. And we had admission committee, faculty committee, they are made responsible to look after that. Similarly, we had other areas like faculty turnover and retirement. We had uh, issues on specialization, what the specialization courses we offer. Is it relevant? Whether students will take it? How risky it is if you don't, uh, if you are not relevant? Then we had uh, placement, whether placement, we have a good placement. Because placement in India, unfortunately, plays a big role in business school especially. May not be an other higher education institute. We are a business school, so we had placement as one of the risk areas to see whether we are at par with other uh, of our peers or not. And we have a mitigation strategy for that, and we have people responsible for that again. Not only placement, we had an intellectual capital the research comes in, whether our research output is in line with the, our, our peers or be beyond the peers, whether they're working hard for that to do, to help our faculty to publish more. Can we do anything? And so we have got a, a whole lot of, like we have better uh, uh, strategy for that. And who is responsible for ensuring uh, good institutional capital? It is the director and the board of governors. We are responsible to provide the right ambience, right facility, right environment for faculty to produce papers, good papers, quality papers. So research output and theme, uh, then I talked about environmental risk. This is one of the most important things which we thought was critical. We will not give much of an importance to it, what will happen, because the regulatory framework is not that harsh on us. But tomorrow it happens, then we are gone. And we are responsible to the society because we are higher education. If we don't teach, our students who are going to teach. So we have, and the ninth one we thought, internal risk operation, finance, staff, attrition, cultural issue. These are very important. Finance is very important. I tell you, finance is very important. Uh, good institutes were facing huge financial problems. There's a say that they say, top line is a vanity. Middle line is a calamity. A lot of manipulation goes over there. And because of that, bottom line has lost all its sanity. So friends, cash flow is the main thing. You can call it a king or a queen, whatever you like. If you're not managing your cash flow properly, that your institute will get into problems sooner or later. Don't be that today we are fine. Because the most, uh, the advantage which education should have, they take money first and then they give the services. Government institute also are guaranteed with the money to some extent. And some government institute has to earn their own money. And most of us here are in, from private institute, we know we have to earn our money, our, earn our cash flow. So cash flow comes first, so there's a chance of being complacent. But if you don't manage cash properly and misuse cash, then you are going to be hit sooner or later. If you're highly leveraged, you're into problem. During COVID, we saw the people who were highly leveraged got into a huge problem and they were not able to pay their staff. Like us, I'm Kosha Bila, uh, Bits, and all, everyone uh, were good. Many, many institutes were able to manage their payment in salary, everything in time, because of better cash management. There was not a single month where my faculty or staff didn't get salary right in time. Everyone got, because we have got EMI uh, obligation, loan payment obligation, students fees, et cetera, et cetera. We honored that. So cash flow has to be managed on day-to-day -day operation. The culture of the institute is very much. We follow a one, uh, uh, one identity culture, in the sense that we recognize each faculty or non-teaching faculty in equal, as far as facility is concerned, everything at par. And we don't discriminate between them. So whether culture has been being built, culture takes time to build, but it, it takes still, 
few hours to destroy it. You know, so it's very difficult stuff. So what I want to emphasize uh, before I hand over um, to the next panelist is that it's important for higher education institutes, in fact, all institutes, by higher and lower, to have a risk management framework. Your risk agenda may be different from my one, but we have to have a risk management focused strategy, mitigation strategy, and dedicated person responsible for them, or a group of persons responsible for that. With this, I hand over to the next panelist. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanyal. That was uh, also wisdom. You know, gratifying to see for uh, somebody like me who's uh, passionate about risk education that, uh, you know, some of the uh, premier management institutes where you have worked with uh, in the country, uh, you know, and you, know, you have uh, implemented risk management framework uh, within uh, higher education uh, system. Uh, I will uh, now turn to Professor Rao, uh, who's uh, from, from uh, you know, a gentleman who's worked with uh, premier management institutes to a gentleman who's uh, worked with premier uh, technical institutes, you know, he's uh, headed IIT and now is uh, uh, at the helm at uh, Vitspilani, uh, on uh, how you see uh, risk management in practice uh, so that risk management uh, can be taught as well. Um, you know, in the background of, uh, you know, some uh, uh, educational institutions elsewhere in the world, uh, you know, I've heard now have a CRO. Uh, you know, I'm told that Stanford has a CRO. Uh, so how do you see uh, uh, future, uh, you know, the current practice and the future of uh, risk management, uh, uh, you know, in practice and, uh, you know, how you will uh, teach uh, in uh, Indian educational system? Thank you. And uh, very happy to be here with all of you today. So the, in fact, you know, I will primarily talk about uh, the, the higher educational institutions. If you look at the oldest institution in the world, is about 1,000 years old, right? Some of those universities in Italy, even Oxford. So how have they survived the excellence? How have they been able to maintain that status, that stature? I think that's something very important because they have been able to manage you know, their risks very well and that resilience is built into the system. And you know, where do we stand you know, in Indian institutions? In India, and also you know, another reason why the risk management for higher educational institutions is important because education is undergoing transformative changes now with chat GPT and all that. Now the biggest challenge in Bits Pilani or even in IIT Delhi, I was director of IIT Delhi for six years before moving to Bits Pilani, the biggest challenge in all our institutions is how do you get students to the classroom, right? You know, if students don't even want to come to the classroom, if that is the first step now, what will be the next step? Next step is students wouldn't even join the institutions. Now, if students are not even joining the institutions, what are these institutions for? If students are learning from the material available everywhere, all around them, and the teacher, you know, role is now declining every day. I mean, we want to talk about the importance of teachers and all of that, but today there is so much of information online, you know, that's going to be a reality at some point in time. So how do we survive as institutions? And if you look at the Indian institutions, there are only two types of institutions. The institutions which are dependent on government, the institutions which are dependent on tuition fee. There is no other institution. Right? We don't have even a proper financial model for either the government institutions or the private institutions. Government institutions, IIT, Delhi, the tuition fee component is about 7%, less than 7%. So for 93% of budget, they have to go back and beg with some secretary in the Ministry of Education. In private institutions, 90% of our revenues come from the tuition fee. Right? So therefore, the tuition fee now is high, obviously. And uh, what do you what do you do? Now you look at good universities abroad. Let's say Stanford, right? And we all want to become Stanford's of the world at some point in time. Stanford, you know, the tuition fee component is about 25 percent, less than 25 percent, right? Where where do the other 75 percent of their revenues come from? They come from endowment fund. Endowment contributes almost 30 percent to Stanford's you know financial uh, model. And uh, in India, which institute has an endowment fund? You know, hardly any institution. You know, thanks to government policies. Thanks to you know our uh, cultural issues, 
nobody wants to give anything to anybody everybody wants to you know pass on things to their next generation but that whole philanthropy kind of a culture which existed before independence is all gone now now everybody is accumulating money and uh, you know which is big a big challenge right now so and what where where the other money comes from in stanford now the research overheads you know the more research they do stanford charges something like 60% overhead on the research project you want to engage a stanford professor with a million dollar grant university takes away 600000 dollars the faculty member is left with 400000 dollars for the actual research work right in india what is the overhead that we charge in institutions the average i studied it at iit delhi you know for 5 years you know the average overheads that we received is like 4% right 4% so that doesn't even contribute any money while we undertake 300 400 crores of research the university gets nothing so eventually it all goes towards establishing facilities and writing papers but the university actually becomes poorer you know with uh, with more and more research happening in our public funded institutions and because most of the money in india comes from uh, public sources right the dst the dbt kind of institutions the overhead component is still very low in even the private institutions now as bits pilani if a faculty member gets a large project right bits doesn't gain anything the faculty member gets the project executes writes some papers and the project is closed but what but the institutions do not really gain anything out of all the research that is happening in that institution so whereas look at the stanford model almost 30% of their revenues come from the come from the overheads charged on the on the on the research uh, projects and the other part comes from other sources like ip licensing and then the they have a huge medical school which is also a big money earner for them now if you look at the stanford model it's a very diversified model whereas in india it's just unilateral right government depending on uh, government institutions depending on mhrd and the private institutions depending on tuition fee we just have no resilience built into our system i think time has come for us now to wake up to that i have been writing about it i have been talking to you know educating the secretaries and many people in the ministries about it i think you know we have to do that we have to keep providing overheads to these institutions we have to ensure that the policies for endowment right for creation of endowment are relaxed today if i if, you know when i go to alumni to raise money the question alumni is how would you invest my money right he says you know if i give you let's say a million dollars and if you are going to put it in some government bonds you know which earn you 4% 5% 6% kind of interest then you know, i can get uh, much higher returns by investing my money in 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 other you know more rewarding kind of scheme so you don't even have proper investment policies why should i park my money with you as an endowment right and uh, what do the what does the endowment people somebody giving money to the government you know it's not very in incentivized right you know these are all the problems whereas in the us the capital gain tax and all of that or the inheritance tax are all so high that instead of transferring money to their children if i give to the university i actually save more money by doing so so the i think some of these policies in india need to change we need to encourage industries to collaborate with academia to provide funding to academia and again they need to get some incentives why would an industry come and give money to to an institute on a platter nobody is going to do that either it has to be through a policy or either it has to be through incentives i think something needs to be done and government doing nothing about it i think our institutions have zero resilience built into that and every year hundreds of institutions are actually closing down simply because we are just dependent on the tuition fee and if students don't join then the institute is institute is finished now so i think that is not resilience at all in the system a lot of things therefore need to change when it comes to our financial sustainability our financial modeling models for higher educational institutions so i think that that is one issue it bits pilani we are now launching a 100 million dollar endowment fund you know we are mostly approaching alumni and, and we are trying to diversify that this is a problem in bits pilani also so the students if you talk to students everybody complains of high tuition fee but then what do we do now so if you don't charge that kind of money how do you run the university how do you pay you know faculty the decent salaries how many institutions in this country pay salaries on par with iits the private institutions how many private institutions pay every faculty member on par with iits i don't want to take the names in public forum there are four or five institutes less than four or five institutions actually pay salaries on par with uh, you know what iit faculty members receive others cannot pay because they don't have the resources 
and uh, you know with that kind of a thing why would good faculty go to these institutions why would students join these institutions it's just not sustainable you know in this country to run higher educational institution right now and you know another way the resilience is we need to build these strategic partnerships and alliances and that is where the industry collaboration is very important and uh, you know bits pilani you know, as one of you mentioned in the previous panel the work integrated learning program is a unique example i mean the without work integrated learning program our tuition fee would have been you know twice that of what we are charging today and that program because there are 46000 working professionals registered for a degree with bits pilani which is completely online so i think that uh, earns lot of revenues for bits pilani which is helping us to subsidize the tuition fee so again such kind of a strategic alliance with we have almost like 650 industries you know working with bits pilani or where their employees are registered for a degree in bits pilani that is one thing that kind of a strategic alliance you know with industries is very helpful for bits pilani i would like to see more and more universities getting into those models you know which can help subsidize the tuition fee uh, and all of that and and again uh, the intellectual property right uh, you know one thing which we are now very seriously looking at is bits pilani has about 15 unicorn founders of which two are decacons right but what have they done to the institute you know these guys have got some idea in the institute gone out started companies made it big right they all want to give back they are all funding companies right out of the wealth that they have generated but bits pilani doesn't get anything out of that now we are going to alumni and we are telling them you know let's create a fund right a kind of an investment fund you fund the startups now out of that fund but some equity in that startup you give to bits pilani right after all you know you have earned all of that money using the the alumni connects that bits pilani has provided now it is time for you to pay back but pay back need not be just a philanthropy traffic kind of a payback you can you invest in companies let those companies you know if you are taking 5% equity give 1% equity to bispilani so that you know one of some of those companies eventually making it big now you know we can can i bits can can become more self sustaining can reduce the tuition fee i think that has become our biggest challenge right now how do we reduce the tuition fee either it is through the 100 million dollar endowment fund or through the wilp kind of a program or through the uh, the alumni uh, you know investing in startups and giving some equity to bits pilani that's very critical uh, right now and even the diversification of academic programs that's also very important engineering institutes cannot just focus on just engineering because times have changed now and uh, you know to develop a product or to be relevant in the society you need to have the diversity you know in our system so because the idea need to get generated you cannot even compete with google or intel you know on any of their technologies right i mean why would google come to an university and fund any research now if you are working in ai area google is way ahead in a, uh, out of everybody microsoft is way ahead in ai they don't even need a, see a need to compete or or, or you know engage in an academic institute and all of that so academic institutions need to become disruptive in their idea generation processes their ideas need to be 10 years down the line while you know while industry knows how to take care of things for the next 3 years 4 years 5 years but you know 10 year kind of a horizon is what they are looking at when it comes to academic research so we need to be able to generate new ideas now we need to become those idea factories idea factories will not arise you know if everything is homogeneous electrical engineer talking to another electrical engineer nothing will happen because anything that you can do in a disciplinary kind of a background all of that is already done now the now the entire innovation is happening at the cross section of these disciplines and there you have to now put bring very different people people with diverse disciplinary backgrounds people with diverse attitudes people with diverse cultural backgrounds coming and interacting with each other that is when new ideas will come up and our universities again have become very homogeneous in nature right you know what kind of a diversity we have in our institutions the even even gender diversity we are struggling right now in our institutions now forget about cultural diversity and many other diversities there again th that has become very important for all of us now you know the diversification of our of our student pool and even the diversification of faculty 
Now to become a faculty member in BITS Pilani or in IIT, what do you need? You have to do bachelor's, you have to do master's, you have to do PhD, you have to write certain number of papers, do a postdoc and you become a faculty member. And you look at 90% of faculty profile, they would exactly be templated like that, right? That is not diversity. Diversity is again, can we have more professors of practice? Can we have people from industries, you know, who have worked there for 20 years of time, come and interact with these academic kind of people? You know, can we have people from different countries, we have gone through different levels of education, different types of education, come and teach in our, in our universities now. I think that is diversification in the faculty. We again lack that diversification in the, in the academic institutions, when it, either at the, even at the faculty level or at the student level, which is hurting us very badly now. This homogenization of education, the higher education in the country is our biggest challenge right now. We need to diversify in all possible uh, kind of ways. So there are again multiple multiple things, you know, uh, scenarios like after pandemics and all of that, we seem to have managed, right? I mean, thanks to all the online technologies, the platforms that have become available, until that time, the only technology we were using as teachers was PowerPoint, right? Other than PowerPoint, what technology we were using really as teachers. But thanks to, you know, at least the pandemic now, you know, we have started using so many variety of platforms. Now it's all AR, VR, you know, we are talking of a lot of new things. So that barrier are the, is gone now to the technology uh, sort of a thing. So I think hopefully the technology wise, we will be, we will be fine. And I think some of these, and, and in the, in the another just last point I would like to make is the technology integration for enhanced efficiency, right? The enhancing the administrative processes. When you hire a new faculty member today, the faculty members have no patience, right? If they want to order an equipment, they want to place an order within a month. They don't want to go through some government e-marketplace and then, you know, look at all of those sites and all of that. You know, nobody has that kind of patience now. And government systems have become so bureaucratic. I, I, I am part of the IIT system. I was in IIT Bombay for 18 years and seven years at IIT Delhi. You know, government has unleashed these five Gs. On the, on the academic system. What are these five Gs? In fact, when I was a director at IIT Delhi, GEM is one of them, right? It's a terror now. The moment you see, say GEM to a, a government employee and look at the reactions of the government employee, you know, that tells it all. After GEM came the GST, right? Government has started imposing GST on the research, which has again, you know, uh, you know dethroned the research for at least one year. The global tender inquiry. Now in IIT Delhi, to buy any equipment, I need the permission of the Secretary Ministry of Education. Why do I need permission of Secretary of Ministry of Education to purchase an, a scientific equipment in IIT Delhi? Nobody knows, but some government servant thought that that's how it should be. Then the GFR, right, government, uh, you know, financial rule thing, which is again a disaster. And then the governance itself is a big challenge. So there are five Gs now which have, which are unleashed on the, on the government system. At least in the private system, we are safe currently from some of these Gs. But, uh, you know, if you are, again, executing any government project, government, again, imposes many of these restrictions. I think time has come now to relax all of these and give, empower the faculty members and then ensure that all of these bureaucratic processes are taken care of. Otherwise, you know, I don't see how our institutions will survive for those thousand years kind of a thing. I think a lot needs to change in Indian higher education system. It's not that I'm only telling you all of this. I have told this to everywhere I have gone, including, you know, many government kind of uh, uh, programs and uh, but you know that, that whole mindset change needs to happen and I hope that happens now sooner than later. Thank you very much. So uh, that was uh, uh, you know some passion uh, Professor Rao brought in, in uh, into the uh, uh, room today uh, you know from uh, looking at a risk heat map in a uh, management institute to how disruption and how uh, enterprise-wide risk management. Risk management across thoughts, uh, across functions, across cross-functions. Uh, Professor Rao, you know, brought it uh, all uh, together uh, on how, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, all uh, practice uh, risk management uh, in your uh, respective uh, uh, ed educational institutions. Uh, from there, uh, let's uh, look at uh, moving to the industry. You know, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a director uh, of risk from uh, Grant Thornton uh, Nishta who's uh, worked across uh, her career, uh, across uh, the 
I call it the three lines of defense. Uh, she's worked across all of them. And uh, she's a consumer of uh, uh, students, uh, you know, who become uh, managers, practitioners of tomorrow. Uh, and she today is a consultant. Uh, and you know, we would like to hear from you, uh, Nishta, how uh, benefits of cultivating a resilient culture uh, accrue to not only to uh, corporates, but also to, uh, let's say, MSMEs, also to um, government bodies. Uh, you know, even uh, you know, today, some government bodies have uh, a risk function. Uh, how can uh, a risk a resilience uh, as a culture uh, impact uh, positively? Thank you, Siddha. Uh, I'm actually thankful to Fiki to give me this opportunity because a lot of time uh, consumer needs are not addressed uh, when we are talking about the situation in a particular sector. And I'm here more, like you mentioned, as a, as a consumer because uh, I've had 20 years of experience in the governance risk management framework and I've spent 13 years of those in industry in various sectors. I've, uh, I've been part of Royal Bank of Scotland, then I was part of uh, Home Credit, which is a non-banking finance company. Uh, I've been part of MMTC PAMP. Um, I've worked as head of internal audit. I've worked as chief risk officer. I've even worked in the first line of defense. And I've spent seven years in consulting. And uh, it's very interesting when we hear Professor Sanyal and uh, uh, people in uh, education institutes talk about the risk management frameworks they've put in place. We do that as part of Grant Thornton with a lot of educational institutes, and it's very heartening to see that a lot of education institutes are nowadays focusing on developing that framework for themselves. I think uh, it's a very good practice because then they, uh, they get to preach what they practice. Uh, as industry, as consulting firms, uh, even in the government sectors, in MSME uh, sectors, there is a lot of shift in focus uh, when it comes to governance. And nowadays, the companies and the governments and the MSMEs, even the, the PSUs, they're all looking at uh, risk management frameworks in a different, in a new light of things. Uh, but what they're struggling with is a huge knowledge gap. They struggle uh, in hiring the right set of people, right set of mindset in their roles to, uh, to fill that knowledge gap. Uh, I, at the start of the discussion, you rightly pointed that we need risk management at every level in an organization. Uh, and when I say that, we, we talk about right from the grass, ground level right to the top management. Uh, it's a, it's a very different kind of a setting when you are actually talking to people at the ground level and when you're talking to people at the top management. With all these uh, uh, new requirements and the, the cultural shift, the top management today does understand the importance of risk management and they want to focus on that. But how that knowledge seeps on at the ground level is very important. Uh, it is very important. We do a lot of workshops and all, and I do a lot of sessions, <coughs> and we, t uh, we try to make people aware that risk management is every employee's responsibility. You can put in a framework in place, you can identify risk areas, you can have risk champions in place, but if they don't understand uh, what is expected out of them, then that doesn't serve much of a purpose. Then the risk management framework uh, becomes a paper on paper exercise. To actually make it function, you need constant uh, training and you need uh, the right set of mindset of people. And I think the education institutes play a, a very important role in that. Uh, earlier, we used to really struggle in, uh, in hiring people with that right set of uh, knowledge. You look at uh, management institutes and all, and very few of them actually cover risk management as part of curriculum. Uh, the Chartered Accountancy course now does have a paper on risk management, but it was also introduced much later. We were looking for chartered accountants because they at least had an audit mindset and they did think about risk as part of the framework. But nowadays, thankfully, there are very risk-focused courses also coming up 
uh, nowadays. Um, I can give an example of Institute of Risk Management that does risk certifications. There are other institutes that does, but uh, a good risk certification is one which actually uh, changes the mindset of person to think from the lines of managing risk. And when I say risk, a lot of people think it is only about uh, just uh, you know doing away with things that may harm the organization. But risk management is actually uh, uh, utilizing how that risk can get, result in higher payoffs as well. So I think it is a very important gap that is there uh, in our education sector because we teach our management students about uh, marketing. We teach them about uh, operations management. We teach them about financial management. But a very important part of running an organization is also risk management. How you can utilize the opportunities and how you can be better, better prepared for uh, you know, uh, negative incidents as well. So uh, when we talk about that, we see a lot of startups coming up. And uh, there are there's a huge number of startups that fail at some point because the the young people the young mindset that are hell-bent towards startups they are too focused on financial management and running the operations that they forget to look at the risks and uh, there are times when then uh, when we as consultants are called to fix the situation but sometimes it's too late and having that mindset right at the beginning actually helps people set the right tone at the top uh, right frameworks right from the ground level. So that is a gap we see a lot. And um, that is where, uh, as a consultant, also we are working. As a, as a chief risk officer, we used to really focus a lot on creating risk awareness, risk culture. We would do uh, uh, exercises of uh, uh, how every employee of a company can focus on risk management. But, uh, but that mindset is, is best developed in the formative years of uh, people, which are during their education years. Uh, uh, school maybe, yes, but uh, I think graduation courses and master's courses are the right forum where we can address that huge demand. And uh, I really do talk to a lot of universities. So we are doing a risk management framework for some of the educational institutes. And we talk to the management. Are you planning to include this as part of you know, curriculums? Or maybe do just organize guest lectures and do some kind of focus workshops on risk management. Because these students will be going out into the world. They will be working in organizations in different sectors, financial, manufacturing, uh, education, and then even uh, tertiary sector in, in services and they will need to on a day-to-day -day basis handle risks manage risks face risks but are they prepared are they having that kind of a mindset or a tool set to deal with that so uh, I, I, I'm very happy that I'm here today I'm, uh, I'm addressing everyone because you are the people who are framing those kind of policies and curriculums and you're uh, uh, meeting our demands of right mindset. So probably as, as teachers, as educators, uh, you should also look at risk management as one of the areas that, uh, that is a gap uh, from industry which needs to be addressed. Uh, we have been hiring some students uh, and people who have uh, done some certifications in risk. Uh, I already mentioned Institute of Risk Management provides that kind of certification. We encourage people to do courses on risk management. We organize courses for some of our clients and uh, that is one way we are fixing the gap. But sometimes when an, uh, a person has been working in a set way for 10 years, 12 years, changing the mindset becomes an issue. And having someone who has learned that as part of their education, uh, that really helps. Because then you are uh, adding on to what is already imbibed inside rather than building up from the scratch. So uh, uh, as a consumer, uh, I would like to say that uh, there is a big, big need for institutes and educational institutes to not just uh, uh, you know do their own risk management frameworks which many of the institutes are nowadays thinking about but also uh, act as an example and then teach the students how to uh, function in an environment where uh, risk management is actively taken care of so those kind of frameworks those kind of curriculums need to be developed
thank you thank you so much uh, nishta for uh, talking about the gap uh, and talking about uh, how uh, educational institutes can uh, work towards uh, <clears throat> uh, you know uh, bridging that gap uh, and also about uh, how uh, you know there is a confluence i mean of uh, functions you know within organizations which uh, today are blurring you know professor rao also you know talked about it how uh two disciplines are blurring you know it, it i mean i am in delhi so it you know i kind of get reminded uh there is a lot of uh, punjabi music out here there is also a lot of rap music out here and uh, you know punjabi rap i'm told is a very in thing you know so there is you know you when you see confluence in music you know i guess uh, it it should be there everywhere you know <laughs> right so um, you know i i just thought i could uh, connect that um you know having said that you know it's very interesting <clears throat> how can educational institutions make a difference uh, you know i'm i'm also in addition to being the cro i uh, i i mentioned that i have I'm passionate about risk education so uh, i i i do some pro bono work for uh, uh, the institute of risk management uh, i'm glad to share that uh, the institute of risk management has actually uh, started collaborative programs with several uh, uh, educational institutions Uh, and uh, they do this by way of uh, uh, teaching faculty uh, making a doing doing a ttt uh, making faculty practice uh, you know uh, certified uh, trainers and uh, then uh, those trainers then can go and uh, do the program uh, in in two ways two broad ways uh, one way you know is uh, by having a, a integrated uh, collaboration which means that all students you know if they are doing a particular program you know they do uh, uh, the risk certification uh, or it is uh, uh, an elective uh, you know they they do it both ways uh, they also uh, you know educational institutions don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, so uh, the content and uh, you know the knowledge uh, comes in from uh, the institute of risk management with its uh, experience across the world uh, you know bringing in uh, indian Uh, risk uh, expertise uh, with uh, global uh, background to all of uh, uh, all of you you know so you know all of you can uh, uh, benefit by uh, lo- make, making an association uh, we have uh, uh, a stall uh, outside you know whom, whom whom you can connect with uh, now uh, we've talked about uh, two esteemed uh, uh, you know we've heard from two esteemed academicians we've he- heard from uh, you know a practitioner we come to a gentleman who's uh, all of them <laughs> he is uh, uh, from for what i understood uh, you know basis my conversation he is an academician he runs uh, uh, a management institute uh, a global uh, institute in india uh, he is also uh, a businessman uh, and he is also involved uh, in some government work okay so we talked about all of that and you know he's all of that so you know what a uh, confluence uh, to kind of uh, close the uh, session with uh, you know in terms of thought and then we'll probably go across seeing across the table how you know th- how this will look at uh, 10 years down the line so alessandro over to you thank you i will have to try with the punjabi rap now <laughs> so thank you very much um you know how dear is this to me risk management in fact uh, immediately i uh, uh, i i jumped on the advisory board of uh, the institute of risk management uh, and we are working a lot uh, uh, with it also with our school uh, i think uh, risk management is more of a cultural issue and uh, uh, i think india is catching up now just it is uh, like it is happening with insurance Uh, for many sociological or uh, insularity issues, uh, mm, that is the situation that is catching up uh, with India opening to the world, uh, India opening to uh, global uh, uh, challenges, and so on. Uh, I think uh, there are two uh, aspects to risk management. One is the processes that for sure are extremely important. Uh, and the other one uh, is uh, the, the the culture the leadership uh, uh, leadership issue so uh, <coughs> um, we are part of a, a international global school and uh, uh, so we do have all the processes uh, in place since uh, the beginning uh, we are 
going through now through equis and all the uh, those processes that are needed uh, but i also think that uh, we did a big job uh, in uh, adapting them to the indian uh, uh, situation india is a, is a country that is changing very quickly and you have different indias in uh, one only india uh, so there are multiple aspects of risk management uh, that are beyond those that you have abroad so <coughs> Uh, as this comes uh, to, uh, uh, to the side of leadership, so you need leadership to embrace risk management and have, have an attitude to risk management. Uh, that is also positive because, as Anishta was uh, mentioning, uh, it opens your mind to, uh, potential, uh, uh, to potentials that are in risky, in uh, difficult situations. So I think that uh, it's extremely important uh, uh, to teach to the students, as Nisha was uh, mentioning, since the beginning, this attitude that is, you mentioned, res resilience, uh, growth mindset, uh, this also all drives an attitude to risk management because uh, I don't think that uh, is just uh, a, a, a department risk management. Risk management is across disciplines. So um, uh, I think I was one of the first to uh, push our students to get the certification with the uh, IRM because you need certain basis and certain structure, how to set processes, uh, that's very important uh, to drive people and to teach them in which direction to go. But uh, it's also very important uh, that uh, risk management becomes uh, uh, fluid in all the activities of uh, company, school, and so on. In fact, uh, uh, in our teaching, uh, uh, because it's our culture, but in our teaching is embedded in all the subjects. So while our students take the certification risk management, but they uh, hear about risk management in marketing, in finance, in HR, across all the subjects for potential uh, uh, benefits of it, but also uh, to see further and to make uh, the, the, the strategy, the corporate, more, more sound. So I think... Uh, 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 it has to be embedded since the, since the beginning, and I've seen it also in uh, our corporate side of the, of the business school, how uh, keeping on pushing, I go every day, almost every day, asking people where are we going in terms of uh, quantity, uh, Sanya was uh, mentioning, but in, in, in terms also of quality. So trying to uh, make them understand that uh, uh, you always have to be on top of every single thing that is happening with a mindset of not just uh, receiving numbers, uh, but to see how these numbers uh, in quantity and in quality are shifting uh, or to see further away uh, what is happening in the market, uh, what are those partners that are going up and down. Uh, so getting back to what I was saying uh, about uh, admissions and placement, uh, for example, this year, before the beginning of the placement season, I said, hey, be careful, all the companies in India that are exposed abroad will have some problems in hiring. So be careful about IT companies, and then they froze, uh, they froze hiring. So you have to be uh, also smart, uh, but uh, uh, with, uh, I think this is all part of an attitude of seeing where the potential and the risk can come. So the attitude is very important. And then for sure, you have to have for teams, the teams that are prepared with uh, certifications, with processes, uh, with things that need to be done. So it's a good mix of the two. For sure, it takes time. It will take time, just like insurance is the, uh, we were talking, is the lowest penetration in the world, I think, in India. Uh, again, for certain specific reasons, not because it's bad, because insurance in India is the larger family. So people didn't need uh, insurance. So for specific reasons, these uh, areas are catching up. And these areas are very important. India now is competing uh, abroad. So whether it, uh, we talk about branding uh, uh, risks uh, or labor uh, risks or, or whatever, uh, it's a much broader, faster uh, uh, risk opportunities that are, that are coming in. So it's great, uh, sorry, I'm not just here to praise uh, you and what Hersh are doing, but it's uh, great uh, what, uh, what you are doing because uh, I've seen it's a big effort in my students that uh, uh, the certification serves, uh, is used uh, for sure to know the processes, but also it sets the mindset. 
uh, they come with a different mindset than uh, when they study other disciplines, they have that mindset of taking care of uh, uh, the, the risk part of it or the potential part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro. That was uh, very interesting how you are applying uh, uh, risk management education's uh, education, uh, you know, in, in, in your institute, uh, you know, how uh, students are benefiting by it and how the industry is benefiting by it. Um, I would uh, pause here uh, and, uh, uh, you know, open up for questions uh, from the audience uh, if uh, there are any. Please do, sir. Yes, my name is Subhash. I am from the Indian industry for the last 40 years, connected with the Indian industry, uh, having projects in Middle East, Europe, and uh, USA, collaborations with the companies. So I was hearing uh, Ms. Karana about the risk management, and she's from the industry. Now, <clears throat> risk is a broader subject right from the manufacturing to the projects to the FMCG or all. So it is very difficult to have expertise in a one particular field. You know, so as she was telling that curriculum has to be fixed by the respective universities and the people here she was addressing to uh, propagate the idea of having the risk management. Now, like uh, projects, I will first deal with the projects, the latest being the tunnel project, where a huge loss has taken place, and nobody would have envisaged this type of glassophoretic uh, mishap, which has happened. And who on the earth will have the risk of that magnitude? So coming to that, now coming to the academies. Now, I'm talking about, because I'm a technocrat. So dealing with the projects all over in India, or the world, you can say, World Bank and all. Now, the risk based, big projects have a lot of risk in, at the tendering stage. I will put it in the tendering stage, where the specifications are made very strict. But the basic thing is the geological survey of a particular place is not done, either by the contractors or by the consultant who is preparing the tender specifications. So here there is no risk manager is involved. If the risk is de decided by the person who are involved, anybody who is a non-technical cannot envisage the risk there. And when the tender is made, and there is a time constraint is there. Two minutes me tender banana or three minutes ko award karna. So so many things are missed. So I would now, I'm coming to my question is that, that which field in the risk management, because any non-technical, if you having a graduation from, you are in the risk, risk Institute of Risk Management, he will be doing, he will not be understanding the technicalities of the project. And now, earlier now, I will come to the, our industry where the people you from the insurance, if I, sir, if you could kindly state the question. Question is that the, which people will be interested with the risk management course? Who can certify there is, there is no risk? This is my question. Actually, the answer to this is very simple. Uh, I would say all of them. Because uh, risk management is not just about one project. Uh, when we talk about risk management as a field of study, it has some uh, very wide methodologies that can be applied to various situations, various functions, various projects. We look at risk management from project point of view, even as a consultant. And many a times it does happen that uh, the, the person whose mind is focused on risk is not just looking at technical aspects of a solution. Uh, if I'm, as a risk professional, uh, talking about and evaluating risks, say, from uh, IT sphere, and I tell uh, from cybersecurity point of view, I need not even be a cybersecurity IT specialist. I don't need certification in, uh, I don't need a BTEC. 
we are talking about risks as a as a uh, as a entity that faces if i can say okay there is a risk on payments being going to a wrong account i can as a risk professional i know that the there is a control required to ensure that the uh, the payments are going to the right uh, uh, person and for that i can advise the company okay you need to put two factor authentications in place for that i'm not specifically telling you okay you need to go for this software that i am sure that the it person is very capable of suggesting but the it person should also be guided at what is it that he needs to provide similarly when we talk about construction projects we talk about uh, any kind of projects uh, i i also look at infrastructure clients and there are huge solar projects and uh, being uh, made and they these projects are actually run as a separate company they they run as a separate project uh, as a as an entity and its whole and these projects have a separate risk register and these risk registers are not just uh, focused on technical or engineering aspects they're also focused on other risks that may be uh, part of the whole project we are talking about safety risks we are talking about environment risks we are talking about uh, delays in projects and what could be the uh, risks associated with delays we're talking about cost overruns so when we talk about risk management they are not just technical aspects they are talking about all the kinds of risk and it could be uh, i always give an example that we manage risks on a daily life you're crossing a road you're looking at both sides that's management of risk and when we talk about businesses we're talking about not just uh, engineering kind of risk we're not just talking about it risk we're not just talking about cyber risk governance basically focus on all kinds of risks a lot of companies and uh, professor sanil gave a very good example they have brand image risk they are focused on uh, low enrollment risks so a lot of companies have put in place an enterprise risk management frameworks and they have built on risk taxonomies or risk registers uh, that could be focused on one project or that could cover the entire entity when we are talking to businesses who are running in infrastructure lines we talk uh, to them and we advise them to build project specific risk registers and then at the central level there should be a central risk management focus as well because within project also there needs to be consistency and you need to align that the risk that are you facing in one project they are either offset or complemented by another project so there may be a, a case where you are uh, you undertaken a project on very low margins but if you have other projects where you are covering the cost overrun risk pretty well it gets offset so risk management needs to be look at a higher level than a middle level and a lower level and uh, every employee needs to imbibe their own knowledge of risks in some way or the other so uh, uh, from academic point of view the certifications that uh, sundar mentioned and all they talk about very nice strategies at all levels of risk management so uh, there are a lot of risk tools that are used to manage risks at project level there could be different tools there could be different tools at so a financial company will obviously be using separate tools than a construction or manufacturing company but these risk certifications uh, they provide you the general mindset and the 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 tool sets that could be applied to various situations i hope i've answered your question so uh, i'll just add one line to supplement uh, in a way your question had a hidden answer uh so who you know will this risk professional with this certification be able to do that job no he will not be able to but that technocrat if he he or she acquires a risk certification or risk education will be able to do a consummate job uh and you know that li there lies the answer you know which we are talking about that you know which alessandro mentioned it has to be a culture change we need to build in a culture i hope that kind of closes the loop on your question sir so i have a question here sir yeah um our risk uh, professionals uh, looked upon as stifling innovation and sorry. change sorry where is that from oh yeah okay yeah. sorry yeah so uh, when you look at risk risk is a cultural thing but in general uh, do risk management professionals run the risk of uh, you know being seen as uh, stopping innovation and like professor rao was talking about all the changes that need to be done and that you know normally risks are regulatory 
or set in place and you know so some of these things while pushing the envelope um, some of the like educate higher education for instance it's not fully evolved at financial services is uh, much evolved and you know there are very defined uh, state of risks and all those things what is acceptable in the case of education a lot of innovation still needs to be done so while defining risks management policies frameworks there it might i mean people need to take a nuanced view in terms of you know how to push the envelope while at the same time managing these things are these challenges real uh, what professionals face uh, i'll uh, try to give a two line answer and then i will uh, you know uh, request my esteemed colleagues to supplement if need be um, so uh, risk is like uh, there is a term in risk and in insurance we call it prognosis uh, and uh, there is uh, something which is called post mortem you know typically an audit or an internal audit or investigation is post mortem um, historically what has happened is uh, you know the audit professionals have migrated to risk okay because the one is looking back one is looking forward um, so sometimes you know this illusion has crept in that you know a typically risk professional will say no to everything contrary to it is that um, a risk professional is supposed to be forward looking okay and risk is not a uh, uh, risk is not bad risk is good okay i, I don't know if you've uh, you know you know it's it's probably not a little out of context but there's a movie called wall street okay where uh, you know michael uh, uh, you know this the, the the protagonist is called a guy called gordon gecko he says that greed is good you know it's 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 a little out of context but the point is that risk is good you know when you think of risk typically you think of something bad but risk is opportunity okay and if you and which is why risk certification and risk education needs to be seen in that light and not as a post mortem uh, and if it is seen in that light then uh, you know all the opportunities which uh, uh, professor rao and uh, uh, you know uh, professor sanyal and alessandro were referring to will come to light uh, else we will you know have the illusion of uh, you know saying no uh, if you would like to add on sir good question let me first tell you if you think that your innovation may be at stake if you put into place a risk management or risk mitigation strategy have that as an agenda like as a brand equity environmental risk innovation is a risk maybe and then you look how to mitigate it and what are steps to mitigate it if your organization is has to be more innovative then it becomes very critical for you to look at very very critically also risk management is a very forward looking concept we see it that way it is not backward looking not historic you have to say hey is my organization dependent on innovation which your question is if that is so and if innovation is stop then i'll be impacted very badly then put in the agenda think through do whatever is required have a mitigation strategy for it and have the right person to look into it that's what my say is if i may add uh, over here uh, i to an extent i agree with you because that's the mindset that has been traditionally built in that risk management is a cost it's a hindrance to innovation it's eating up your funds but uh, it again and it breaks down to what alessandro said it's a cultural mindset change when people are <coughs> studying risk management as a as a field of study they tend to look at it as a forward looking exercise they tend to see the benefits that are derived from that uh, the, by putting a risk management framework in place and a lot of corporates nowadays are coming to that mindset because uh, initially it started with just compliance with statutory requirements but over time they've seen the benefits how it extends beyond just statutory requirements and uh, we talk about governance at a at a uh, at a very uh, uh, 
detailed level when we talk about risk management frameworks being put in the companies and the boards and the stakeholders and the shareholders, they see the value that comes. Initially, uh, every company has a mindset, oh, the government wants us to do this, so we have to spend funds on this. We have to actually, uh, you know, uh, bear these costs. But when they see that they bring in synergies, that brings you more uh, funds and more, uh, you know, turnover and monies from other aspects then they see the benefits. So unlike internal audit, it is a very forward-looking exercise. Uh, if you look at the traditional uh, uh, trends in, in the industrial sectors, even internal audits were initially looked as costs. And they became mandatory only because the government wanted to make them mandatory. Uh, that if you reach a particular size of uh, of you know asset size or a turnover side, you need to have an internal audit independent assurance in place. Similarly, uh, now the companies are looking at it as benefits because uh, uh, internal auditors are bringing to light where they went wrong. But sometimes it's too late. That's where risk management comes into place. Even before things go wrong, you're looking at the future that this is something that can go wrong what do I need to do right now so that it doesn't happen? So I think uh, uh, it is a mindset that needs to change. It is a cultural change that needs to come. And a lot of companies that are in a, uh, putting in a risk management framework in place are uh, l really looking at that uh, benefits that they are deriving from that point of view. I think I, I can just give you a very short uh, answer to that. You know, in an academic institute, you have to take risks, right? If you're starting a new curriculum, new program, new things, you are taking a risk. You don't even know whether you know students will join or not. But I think uh, through that, you cannot avoid. If you don't do that, then you are stuck and nothing much will happen. But the early failures are important. You need to you know, put into the entire system early failure model. I mean, if you take a program, the program is not running, and you are running it for 10 years, 20 years, don't want to change, then there is a, that's a doom to fail. So I think that learning from the early failures and changing, making course corrections is the only way. You know, we need to keep trying. Governments, you know, have a different problem. I mean, their rules are all made to prevent that 10% misuse. In the process, 90% of people suffer. And I don't know when governments learn to make rules which are you know, for those 90% of people, but that's how governments function. Sir? So? I, I just wanted to make a very quick example that has already started before, <coughs> how uh, proactive risk management can be beneficial. Uh, what at the, end of, at the beginning of the year, I told my team, hey, be careful, uh, certain sectors that are exposed abroad, uh, uh, this year, we're way above the placement of last year, in a year where everybody's complaining that placement is bad. Sir? Wow. Uh, we, we, we have Here. a lot of time, but we'll take one last question. Sir? Here. <laughs> in fact, that's how I moved to private system, right? I couldn't survive. <laughs> so 25 years was too much for me. So the being what I am. So <laughs> sir, I have, I have one question, sir. Here. Sir, I have one question. Here. Sir. A uh, respected mem member on a dais. Sir, uh, actually, good afternoon all. Myself, Prasant Kumar. I'm a student of MBA International Exposure at NIU, Noida International University. So I have uh, one question regarding risk, uh, risk management in higher education. So my question is, economic bias is one of the most common barrier, and it affects students who experience poverty more disp uh, disproportionately than others. So how can, how can we take care of them? So economic bias is one of the most common barrier, and it affects students who experience poverty more dis disproportionately than others. So how can we take care of them? I'll give a very short answer. 
it's slightly out of the curriculum because this is not what the topic was about. But uh, this is something that the government, where, where the government needs to step in. And one of the ways they are stepping in is uh, uh, Skill India program, where they are providing a lot of uh, opportunities for the uh, for the lower economic strata to come up the curve. A uh, lot of uh, educational institutes provide scholarships and all as well and I think that is that is kind of a control measure you're applying to this risk so I, I speak from the language of risk management that there's a this is a risk where you lose out on good students because they're not able to uh, you know uh, afford a quality education and that's where you need to put in controls and programs like scholarships and uh, programs like that yeah in the beginning of the day uh, Sanjay ji was here and he was talking about uh, apprenticeship programs and uh, programs by uh, AICT promoted internships. Uh, so those are uh, areas which, uh, you know, I mean, I honestly, I look, looked up my phone and I saw that, wow, this is amazing. You know, I, I should make use of it. So uh, awareness, I think, is a big uh, area. You know, there, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of stuff being done which uh, students are not aware of, even working professionals are not aware of. So I guess that uh, uh, hopefully answers. Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, ma'am. You know, my, we, we have two and a half minutes beyond time. You know, I am being uh, pushed. You know, if you can please, uh, the gentleman at the back. Uh, well, as the gentleman has mentioned about the uh, tunnel uh, problem, you know, how to really cover up all those risks, you know. I would like to add here, that uh, whatever, uh, while making the tenders and uh, spacing out certain things, one must mention the risk, which is unforeseen, number one. Number two, that I would like to remind you of the film like uh, 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 that, that Inferno. In that film, it was only a small little uh, risk, you know, which the managers, out of greed, reduced the size of the wire by one small little size, you know, and then this inferno uh, took place. And I would like to tell you something very important, that there is a truck being made somewhere which carries about 400 tons of material in one go. The gear which is really making the whole thing move, that each gear tooth was checked by putting lot of load on this to avoid that risk that it may not fail there. So I would like to say finally, the ability of a person which uh, the risk management people are looking for is the ability of the person who's working on it. Basically, the, uh, I, I did talk about spiritual literacy. I would like to say that the creative intelligence of a person it's like an omni scanner, the attention, which can see and act in all the directions. We would like that all those students who are studying in the education should really get that to become master of all and jack of none by using this ability of an omni scanner to look into all those risks and then work on it. And that is what, again, I would like to say, the necessity is to develop that spiritual literacy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, if you can, yeah. Yeah, it can, we will have this as the last question, if we may. Yeah, in the realm of innovation, the success rate is 30%, which means on the other side, the risk of failure is 70%. So can risk management raise the success rate? Uh, this is this is a universal thing, the thirty percent success rate. I would say most certainly, most certainly, you know, without a doubt. I mean, I don't have any other answer. We've seen hundred percent success rate in this area, sir. We do risk management fr uh, frameworks. So, uh, um, uh, at the risk of sounding uh, a bit, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, towards uh, promoting Grant Thornton, but we work with a lot of promoter-driven companies who are aspirational. And when they install a risk management framework in place, these are usually small players, MSMEs, that are coming up the curve. They see immediate benefits. They do see immediate benefits because as professionals who are not attuned to thinking about risks every day, you miss out a lot of areas and opportunities that a higher risk 
taken with the good uh, you know controls framework in place can bring to you so definitely yes that rate improves if you put a good uh, and active risk management framework in place uh, sometimes the companies just want to go by the government requirements and put a put a framework in place on paper but that will not help you in the long run so yeah uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are more questions, you know, we can address it uh, off the dais. Uh, you know, I, the scanner is saying 230 beyond and, you know, it stopped now. So it's, it's an indication. Thank you very much. It's been an amazing uh, uh, hour plus. You know, uh, you know I, I am personally enriched uh, by all the conversation. I hope you are all enriched uh, by the discussion over here and you will go and implement uh, risk education and risk management practice in your respective organization. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we now break for lunch. The next session will commence at 2.15. I would request everybody to be seated back in time for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>